Welcome in to End Alzheimer's. We have with us today neurologist Dr. Lewis Robinson to talk about semifilam. Uh, this is not uh, this is not supported or uh, sponsored by Cassava Sciences. This is just uh, Dr. Lewis Robinson uh, talking honestly about his opinion. Uh, let's get right into it. Dr. Okay. Robinson, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Welcome okay. in to End Alzheimer's. We have with us today neurologist. So, Hello? so I think, do you have the, uh, the stream open perhaps? I think. Uh, uh, this is not, uh, hmm. so this doctor, is not I think, I think uh, Dr. Robinson, I think, uh, you might have the, uh, the, the stream open in a different window. Did you have the, the, if you open up the stream, I think if the hey, Mark, has a window. Uh, let's get right into it. I don't know. We were talking fine before. Dr. Robinson, how are yeah, you? Yeah, but now I'm we're good. broadcasting on YouTube. I'm good. So. Uh, now it's now it's 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 coming through that browser window. I can't hear. One second. So that's that's from the past. Asking uh, this the stream opening on a different window. Did you have the the if you open up this stream link? Hey, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Robinson. I don't know. We were talking fine before. Uh, uh, if you go to like good. Google Chrome, Martha, something about a screen. Hold on. Hi, Martha. Hi, Joe. Hi, Martha. The uh, the the YouTube stream is open. If you can close the YouTube window, please, because we're, we're getting an echo. I'm saying we're we're talking, and then it's coming in ten seconds later. Okay, yes. just a moment. That from the past, ask it. Is the stream open in a different window? Did you have the, the if you open up? I the probably screen, did. Mark, I don't know. We were talking fine before. Hi, Martha. Joe. Hi, Martha. The the YouTube stream is open. If you can close the YouTube window, please. How's that? We're getting an echo. I'm saying we're we're talking and still hearing it for the moment. Just a moment. Yep. From the past, ask it. Most of the people will see this in the in the future anyway, so we'll cut this out anyway. But this is, this is the this is the fun part. <laughs> mm. The chemistry gets deep, everybody. So uh, this is this, we'll enjoy, um, the, enjoy the. Can you just? I think I think. Can you advise me how to get the screen up again? Well, whatever. So yes, uh, whatever you're doing is working. Just, uh, just it, we can hear you and see you. So. And there's no longer an echo. So oh, really? Yeah, you did it, Martha. Well, let's just go with that. Yeah, we're all we're all set. Just got a small screen. Okay. Uh, Is it you, working, Joe? If you if you, if you go to where your apps are, like if you mouse over to the bottom of the screen, the side of the screen, all the apps come up. If you click on Zoom, that might be it. Where is Zoom? This is embarrassing. <laughs> no, I, I feel bad. I, I, there I, it is. Okay, how about now? Perfect. Yeah, you're absolutely perfect. Yeah, and you know what? I, I should have told you to not have that window open. My, I very, that's my, that's on me. So sorry about that. That's so funny. We we got here half an hour early. Immediately everything worked. So we, we we killed half an hour. <laughs> and then that, that right. Okay. So you can see me and everything. Well, you know, it would have been a sh yes. But everything's great. Yeah, it would have been a shame to not meet Martha. So uh, so it, it, it's a good <laughs> right. She's a much better half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, and, and thanks for your patience with that. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Robinson, I'm going to launch right into it. Uh, can you please tell us a bit about yourself and your scientific background? Okay. Well, um, basically, I was a clinical neurologist uh, for 32 years. That's what I did. I saw patients, treated them. I wasn't an academic. I did uh, do some teaching to uh, medical students about how you do a neurologic exam for a bit, but basically I was taking care of the sick. So I have a huge experience with demented people. I mean, conservatively, if you think that I saw one a month, which is way too low, that's over 300 people right there. Yeah, really. Um, you know, over 30 years and 12, you know, but it's, it's probably much closer to a thousand. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I was a clinical neurologist, but you know, I retired uh, 20 years ago, but my, my experience with neurology with Alzheimer's did not stop then. I've lost an uncle to the disease since I retired. My wife lost an aunt. I lost a very good 
a college friend who wrote like 40 papers on drug development. Uh, and it, it's a disease that can affect anyone, no matter how smart you are. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the genius grants from the MacArthur Foundation, but there are very few and you, you can't nominate yourself. Other people have to nominate you. And the husband of a friend of mine has it and he doesn't know where he is anymore. Oh so it's an awful, awful, yeah. awful disease. Um, now, as far as the pedigree and who I am and what I, the degrees and all, I'd like to save that to the end because it really just gets in the way. Okay. I want if if I want people to listen to what I say, evaluate it based on what they hear, and never mind where I went to school. I'll, I'll I'll get that at the end. It'll become obvious what I know and I don't know. Okay. Um, now I got in. Of course, I've been interested in Alzheimer's disease, and I had the background in chemistry to understand all the stuff. But how do I know Lindsay Lindsay Burns? I assume most of the people watching your show know who Lindsay Dr. is. Burns, yep, Dr. Burns, the the, the yep. from Cassava Sciences. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Do yeah, you, absolutely. you guys yeah, know everybody, who yeah, is? everybody watching the show knows uh, knows Dr. Burns from uh, Cassava. Here's Sciences. something you don't know about her. She's an Olympic athlete. <laughs> she won a silver medal in the two women's crew in yeah. the in the Olympics. I don't know how many years ago, yeah. but which is pretty impressive. But anyway, yeah. so from 72 to 87, I practiced neurology in Billings, Montana. And you get to know a lot of people in Montana. And I got to, and my wife and I became friends with Lindsay's parents, uh, Horatio and Sheila. And they were ranchers out of Big Timber, Montana, which is about 80 miles west of Billings on the Yellowstone. They have a beautiful, beautiful ranch, or they did, uh, on the east slope of the Crazy Mountains, which are just north of Big Timber. And, you know, just like if you know friends and they've got teenagers, you know, sort of know who they are. And I know who Lindsay and her two brothers were, yep. but I really didn't interact that much with Lindsay. But only later on, when Lindsay went on to school and got her PhD and began working in Alzheimer's disease, uh, did we reconnect? And we've been going back and forth with emails and, and things for years and years. So I really no Lindsay, but wow. yeah. um, I do want to make it very clear that what I'm going to say is not inside information from Lindsay. Okay. Um, both of my in-laws, my father-in-law and mother-in-law worked for the SEC. And years ago when I met them uh, down in Virginia, they would, they would talk about their work. And what, where do you think the waste baskets go in the SEC? Uh, the, the, but the they burn them. They burn them. <laughs> the shredder. I couldn't believe it. They don't put their trash out because their information is so valuable. So I've been very clear and I made it clear to Lindsay about what inside information is and what can be shared and what could I know. So everything you're going to see from me yep. um, is based on my clinical experience as a neurologist, what I've read. Okay. And one little bit of inside information from Lindsay, but it's it's not that crucial. Okay. Um, so I really. Uh, so what is there's been a lot of talk about femtomolar and other stuff that people have difficulty accepting, yep. and I have too. And Lindsay and I have gone about it. I don't think that that is a meaningful topic, but that all that stuff is irrelevant. Okay. To what's going on and i'm going to tell you why i think all that stuff is irrelevant and it all has to do with their data yes they uh, she presented data last august at some conference i think it was in denver about the first 50 people to go for nine months or a year i forget which it was and they showed you know some benefit when they were looked on as an aggregate but what was really impressive, and Joe, maybe you can put up a link to that thing uh, later on afterwards, sure. if people That's want to look idea. at it. Great idea, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, so, but what was really impressive was the five. There had five people who improved, they, they mentioned uh, something called an ADOS-COG score. Now this takes a long time. No neurologist could do an ADOS-COG while they're in clinical practice because it takes three quarters of an hour. You'd have no time to, to tap the reflexes. Yeah. I mean, but this, yeah. but this is what they did. And of those five people that did, did the best, they got a 50% improvement in their cognition 
at nine months. That's incredible. I never saw anything like that. Yeah. No neurologist no. ever saw anything like that. Yeah. So at this point, all the stuff about biomarkers and fudging data is irrelevant. The only thing that is really significant is that there are is that data. Yeah. And somebody else who looked at the at the uh, post noted that the people who above the people that did 50% also did a lot better. Yeah. And so there, there really are a group of people who responded to pseudomophilam. Now this is, you know, not placebo control that's yep. going on, yep. but they just, they responded in a way that no neurologist has ever seen anyone with Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Fun. Yeah. Wow. Period. And that, so at that, that's where I want to take off from. Okay. Uh, and, and not, uh, we can talk about proteins and all that in a bit, but okay. um, so these, these people, you know, just did incredibly well. So now you don't call a neurologist when things are going well. <laughs> and as a neurologist, you're always thinking about what could I do if something goes wrong? What is the worst thing that could happen and how would I respond to it, okay? So what is the worst thing? There are three worst things that could happen to this data, okay? All right, here they are. One, they're lying. Yep. This is just totally fabricated. Um, in the family, but these things happen, you know, there is fraudulent data this stuff has been published in the New England Journal. There's no way around that. Yep. Okay. There is Fair absolutely enough. no way around that. Fair. Joe, you're frozen. Darn. Ah. Joe? Yes. You were you froze. Okay. Am I good? You are good. You are good. I don't know. Can you hear me? Can yeah. You, oh, you can hear me. Okay. Keep please keep going. Yeah, I can hear it. Tell you what, uh, just Dr. keep going. Yeah, Dr. Robinson, this stream will keep going. So I think you will keep going. Or not, I take it back. I don't know if it will or not. <laughs> uh, but for so far, we're good. Well, you're, you're sort of broken up. Well, as long as you can hear me, uh, I, I can see you and, and, and you, you're still coming in. So as long as you can. All right. Me, okay. Please, we'll keep going. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, we do. I'm used to this because I have a son in law, son and daughter in law in Hong Kong. Oh, my. And so we're always doing this. And there's times they break up and times they don't, you know, <laughs> all that. Okay, so that's number one. They're lying. Yeah. Okay. And there's there's just no way you can, if they're lying, they're lying, and we're all toast and you're toast, and all the people that bought the stock are toast. <laughs> I don't think that's likely, but it's there. Yep. Okay. Yep. The second one, and, we, and Lindsay and I talked about this at dinner last fall in, in Boston at the Alzheimer meeting. People are actually paid to get into these yep. studies. And could somebody be paid, be faking? Alzheimer's disease and then to just for the money and then get better. That's a possibility. Yeah. Apparently though, I don't know. I think that's pretty remote. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and the third one, go ahead, Joe. Yes. I was going to say, keep talking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I can, you I can still see you and hear you. Yeah. So you, if you can hear me, please keep going. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, that, so that's one. The other one, you know, they have different sites uh, where they test people. It's not all in one place. Mm -hmm. yep. And so at the and this is the only inside information I'm in possession of. And now you are, too. <laughs> Could it be one site that screwed up and tested these people wrong? I mean, are all these five people that did so fantastically well, are they all coming from one site? Yeah. No, they're all from different sites. That's and that's extremely positive yes yeah okay so now we're going to take so i go back to my friend i went to medical school with in chicago <laughs> university of chicago I didn't go to chicago he went to the university of chicago and joe told me he's a philosophy major and right, yep. philosophers are deep thinkers and <laughs> looking at causes and all that stuff and uh this this guy was was really funny he says that's how it works in practice but how does it work in theory <laughs> you know which is and that's where we are with the femtomolar stuff yeah okay what's what what lindsay has shown is that there's this incredible effect on some people with the disease or with something we're calling alzheimer's disease and everything else 
literally becomes irrelevant. I'll talk about proteins and confirmation later, but that's you, the data is either false, and if it's true, then it's significant, yep. very significant. Yeah, very. So um, let me talk a little bit about how uh, doctors classify disease. I'm going to go way back. Okay. Back in the old days, people classified diseases by fever, <laughs> by the pattern of fever. This is before Pasteur and, and they even knew what bugs were. <laughs> and so I was sent up to Lyme, New Hampshire to work with Dr. William Putnam because he was the medical school I went to was considered him a great doctor. Mm -hmm. And Dr. William Putnam of Lyme, New Hampshire made one of the most brilliant diagnoses I've ever heard of. And it was all based on the pattern of fever. Wow. And so he would get called and yes, GPs made house calls then. Oh, gosh. And he got called that we're burning up and he could, we're burning up, I've got 104. And he'd get over there and they were afebrile. Right. Well, I don't know what the hell that was. So yeah. next day goes on, they're okay. And then, then two days later, they get called up. Same. I'm burning up. You've got to come over. I feel terrible. When he got there, the, the fever was gone. Right. And so Dr. William Putnam of Lyme, New Hampshire, diagnosed people in Thetford, Vermont. I think that's where they were living across the Connecticut with, with one of the most brilliant diagnoses. And the reason he did it was because he was a GP and he knew his patients. What, they what he diagnosed in malaria, malaria. He what he diagnosed in Vermont was malaria. Oh my gosh. And the reason he what did it was because these people were economists and had been in Nigeria uh, and came back to the state. Yeah. And that is the most brilliant, brilliant frigging diagnosis that's I ever brilliant. heard of. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's something else. Okay. Yeah. So that's so that's uh, that that's the way doctors diagnosed it then, and it, it even had a utility back in the day. Yep. Then you know, then in in Billings, I ran a muscular dystrophy clinic, mm -hmm. and uh, it was very very it was quite an experience. I mean, I did other things, but that was one of the things I did. Yeah. And back then, this is from seventy two to eighty seven or somewhere in there. And so um, we, we would diagnose something called limb girdle dystrophy. Well, the limb girdle is the shoulders and the hips, and that was muscle weakness there. And you know, muscular dystrophy isn't every muscle gets weak. It's just, uh, there, there are patterns of it. So, well, you know, 72 to 87 was before we could sequence genes. And now we know 37, or what was it? something over 30 different mutations that cause limb girdle dystrophy. Wow. So limb girdle dystrophy isn't one disease. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And Alzheimer's disease in a very similar way may not be one disease, which may well be why you had these 10% of people respond so well. Right, right, right. So, yeah. You know, that, that's my, uh, my thinking on the matter. Yep. Uh, it's a miracle that they found it. I mean, just think about it. Think of, you know, their, their incredible cancer therapies with something yeah. called CAR and right. antibodies and all that. Right. They don't work in everybody. Yeah. No therapy works in everybody. There's no infection that you give one antibiotic for and they all get better. There's no epilepsy that you give one anticonvulsant for. You try this one, you try that one. So that's, that's my take on those results. But the fact that those results are so spectacular, unless they're lying, <laughs> means that, that the drug has to be tested, which of course yep. is why it's so appalling yeah. that there, somebody wrote trying to stop the study. I'm, I mean, these people need help. Yeah. They need help. And <laughs> to stop the study because of some imagined side effect is just appalling. Yeah. It's, it's, so what, what's about that, Joe? I'm, I'm sorry, says what, what's what about? Well, what, where, where is, what's the status of the citizen of, petition of the CRT? Yeah, the citizens' response or whatever. Yeah, it's, so, it's a great question. Yes, yeah, so the people that have a stated short interest in the company uh, on the claims of, of safety, when there was when there's been no safety concerns at all tried to stop the trial, submitted two citizens' petitions to stop the two phase three trials. We're coming up at the uh, beginning of March on 180 days, which will be the terminal point. 
So uh, there's, it's actually one is, is like February 19th and one will be like uh, March 1st or so. And then they'll be, if, if they're not responded to, they're automatically dismissed. So hopefully uh, either dismissed or not responded to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's another point about the, the FDA and that is that's very significant and doesn't always happen is the FDA has, you know, Cassavis Biosciences submitted their protocol for the trial you know, what they were going to do, how they were going to test, blah, blah, blah. And that's been accepted. So it's not something like which just happened with Aduhelm where they want more data before they're going to do anything. Right, right. If the study is, if the study goes on, they complete the study, that's it. They don't have yeah. to do anything. Well, that, that doesn't always happen. That's a very significant thing that the FDA accepted the study. But yeah. let, let, this, let the study proceed. Let heads roll if they roll. And uh, okay, so that, that's, that's really, um, in, really incredibly important. Yeah. So now yeah. I'd like to go a little farther and talk about one of why Lindsay's mechanism yep. is nice, yeah. but it's pretty far out and it may, it's still irrelevant to the okay. data they have. Okay. But I'm going to tell you about an incredibly good story about the cause of Alzheimer's disease. Okay. It's really good. So I got to talk, and it stopped me if this rambles on too yeah. long. I got to tell you about how proteins are. Okay. The proteins are like railroad trains. Okay. Uh -huh. they have, there's one end that's the uh, engine, and there's another end that's a caboose, and there's everything in between. Interesting. And, pro, and, pro, and in other words, it's a very linear thing. It's just a big string. Yeah. Now, the uh, filament A is an enormous protein. It's got 2,600 amino acids. Wow. Yeah. 2,600 cars. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now, the cars can be any one of 20 things. Okay. And the order is incredibly significant in what order the cars are. So you can give each car a number starting from the engine at one and the caboose at 2,603. Yes. And it could be anyone. And so just to show you, if you, well, they're, they're what are there, 26, 27 letters, something like 26, that. 26, yep. So, and just changing the order is significant. Consider the two words, united and untied. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All you've done is switch two letters. Yeah, okay? right. In sickle cell anemia, which is a protein of under 200, it's just one change from yeah. one of the 20 to another of the 20. So these things are really uh, significant. Yeah, I'll say. So I want to yeah. talk about I want to talk about this protein called A beta which you've probably sure. heard about. Amyloid beta sure. But, but, but uh, and so we now for the first time we really understand the structure of amyloid and the, the senile plaque in A beta. So now I want you to think instead of this linear string of pro of, of uh, choo choo trains there's a train wreck and they were all the cars were thrown into the field and so you have this pattern you have a linear they're still all hooked together yeah okay but they're the pattern in the field is all over the place okay and they now know what that pattern is for a beta okay now so they're instead of a protein that's in three-dimensional space and flopping all over the place like a bowl of a ball of twine, okay? Yeah, yeah. They're all flattened out on a plane. Okay. okay? And now, um, amyloid, just imagine a thousand of these, or 10,000 of these planes on top of each other. Okay. And they're all lined up, one on top of the other, and that is what amyloid and the senile plaque is. Okay. It's all okay. these this protein of, a beta, which is, you know, you know, a peptide of either 40 or 42, uh, 42 cars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they're all lined up. Now, it turns out, uh, you don't have to know much chemistry, but it turns out that, uh, I got to look at the notes, mm -hmm. that car 22 and car 23, now yes. of these 20 cars, there are four of them that have charges. Some of them are plus, two of them are plus, two of them are minus. 
And car 22 and car 23 are both minus. Okay. Well, if you put all that negative charge uh, next to one another and stack it on top, that really is a pretty high energy. Interesting. So if you have uh, the Arctic form of familial Alzheimer's disease, CAR-22 goes from a charged amino acid to an uncharged amino acid. So it makes it more stable. Huh. So in other words, instead of having a 10,000, you know, a thousand, uh, you know, 2,000 charges jammed next to each other. Yeah. Suddenly diminish the charge. Well, let's go on. Yeah. Let's go on to the Dutch form. And in the Dutch form, CAR-22 goes to something without a charge. And they have familial Alzheimer's disease. Same place, different mutation. In other words, a mutation just takes a, a one of the 20 possibilities in any position to something else. So that's what it did. It just changed one amino acid yeah. in this 40. And these people get early Alzheimer's disease. Now let's go to the Italians. The Italians is even more interesting. CAR-22, which has a negative charge, goes to something called lysine, which has a positive charge. So you just neutralize two charges. The thing is more stable, and these people get Alzheimer's disease. So you're, ta you're talking about charges of the amino acids that make up a, a beta? Right. Yes. Okay. Interesting. So, so in other words, instead of having a whole bunch of charges smashed together, you've neutralized it, and you've lowered the possible energy yeah. of formation yeah. of the amyloid. And these people get Alzheimer's disease. Now, there are three more I can do. No, there are two more I can do. But you get the picture. That is such a compelling picture yeah, yeah. to a chemist that A beta has simply got to, to have something to do with Alzheimer's disease. And it was an incredibly logical move. Yeah. Well, let's get rid of the frigging A beta. <laughs> right. But it hasn't worked. Right, right, right. So here you have an example of absolutely perfect theory. It's so beautiful to a chemist. I hope I, you got some sense. You, you, you of made, yeah, I really appreciate it. I'm starting to understand it now. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, it's so elegant. The, the other two are equally elegant. And yet it didn't work. I mean, it's a beautiful, that's how yeah. it works in theory, right. but that's not right. how it worked in practice. And so that's why, I, you know, even though people are all excited about femtomolar, and I don't think that that's a meaningful, con, uh, a meaningful, concept yeah. at, at this level yeah okay. that all goes out the window yeah. in the face of their data okay right right, right. assuming their data is true yep. assuming that people didn't sign up to be paid to get in the study uh you know so yeah. that's that's why uh i'm where it's i'm where it's at that's pretty much great yeah that, that was pretty much i didn't realize so it's the mechanism that, it's the mechanism that failed yeah I didn't realize that the a, the a beta had a charge, and then like you were explaining to me off camera, the, the, this is this is uh, excitatory neurons. We're talking about the nervous systems. We're talking about electrons and electricity. So those charges yeah. are yeah. And then these ion channels send like a million charged atoms per second through uh, yeah. through the ion channels into the neurons. It's a miracle we're alive. <laughs> Yeah, and it's because the, 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 these these channels are charged. They're not operating on like ATP or any other energy. It's because they're charged. So putting a different charge next to them, and the, the, these amyloid plaques are charged. And so that was the theory. I never understood that. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, that's that's what Lin Lindsay what Lindsay is saying, which is really so amazing, is that the flow of ions through the channel is irrelevant. Okay, which, which is radical as hell. There are other. Just about every ion channel has what's called auxiliary proteins next to it. And A beta binds to one of these auxiliary proteins, which then changes conformation and alters the conformation of filament so that filament goes over to another protein called tau, and that's the neurofibrillary tangle, right. which is also a form of amyloid too, which just came out in a couple of months ago. So uh, neurofibrillary uh, tangles that's are also just hairy as hell. Yep. Neurofibrillary, neurofibrillary tau tangles are a form of amyloid? Yeah, neurofibrillary, they're another form of amyloid. How, how? 
just like the A beta. They're all flat. They're all flattened out. Okay. And they're stacked on each. Thousands of them are stacked on top of one another. Is that what amyloid means is flattened and stacked? Basically, that's it. And believe me, we've been looking at it for 50 years. Huh. And we finally, we, I can't say we, I didn't do it. There's a guy at Stanford who did, you know, incredible stuff. But we've now, you know, we've now figured it out. So these and that's what it is. angles are flattened and stacked as well. So they are also, they're amyloid towel. They're, they're inside the cell. Oh, okay. The, 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 the okay. plaques are outside the cell. And then the, 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 the tau neurofibrillary tangles are inside the cell. Yeah, inside the neuron. Got it. Thank you. But, but they are also flattened and stacked. Yep. Interesting. And, and so they would be called amyloid. Fascinating. Yeah. Then they'd be called amyloid. Are, well, you know, it's really fascinating because they don't stain, the, the neurofibrillary tangles didn't really stain like amyloid, and that faked people out for a while. But when they finally got the actual what they call cryoelectron microscopy of it, it, it it's the same, it's the same story. Yeah. And uh, okay. So, all right, I'm going to stop now. Okay. Okay. That's well, I'll go on, on to question number two. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so that was the first question was, uh, was, can you tell a bit about yourself? That was half an hour, <laughs> which was wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. I really appreciate that for the first it was time. really half an hour. Yeah, it really was. And for the first time, we've been talking about Alzheimer's for a year. For the first time, I, I understood some of this stuff. So I really appreciate it. The, 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 the plaques. Okay. And, and then so it's interesting. So that was, and then and then they knew, though, we know now at least that some people have the plaques. Everybody that has Alzheimer's has the plaques. But plenty of people have but a lot plaques. of people have the plaques who don't yeah, have, have it. You bet. Yeah. So that's in, it's so, like gray hair. Yeah. yeah. Joe. Yeah. Uh, I can, like I can gray hair. You. Okay. I can, I can still hear you. Yeah. <laughs> You know, this here's white hair, okay, yes. on my beard. Yes, yes. But if you took it, if you took a white hair from my wife's head, who started when she was in her 30s and started to go gray, it would look the same. And the same thing is true about the senile plaque of Alzheimer's. It doesn't look, it is no different in an elderly person than someone who gets Alzheimer's disease at a young age. Now, remember, when, when Alzheimer described his disease, it was in a young woman. And so for a long time, Alzheimer's was called pre-senile dementia. Wow. Does, does that ring a bell? No. You heard that term? No. So in other words, this was a woman uh, under 50. Yeah, wow. I didn't who know. Uh, had it. Wow. But the thing is, if you look at the plaque of someone who's dying of Alzheimer's at a young age, and your grandmother or uh, my uncle who died just shy of 90, you couldn't tell the difference. It's the same thing. So it looks like, in other words, there's really no difference between the plaque of a young person and the plaque of an old person. Somehow the process is accelerated. Yeah. And I just told you about mutations that do accelerate the process yeah. and how enormously logical it was yeah. to get rid of it. Right. But you know, if you think about it, you look at a microscopic slide of somebody um, with any sort of neuropathology, and there are three possibilities. You see some glob, that's what basically they saw mm -hmm. back in the day. And the three possibilities, it's, it's, the sh it's the bullet that killed, no, it's the shooting, it's the smoking gun that killed the neuron. It's a pile of spent bullets that the cell used to defend itself. Right. Or it's the way a neuron dies. In other words, there are two possibilities where the plaque is actually irrelevant. People assume yeah. for years and years that this thing was causing it. Right. And I've just given you incredible evidence based on the chemistry yeah. uh, of how that is. But, yeah. but it didn't. Um, but it didn't, it didn't happen. So there you have it. So, okay. 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 So that's, Pretty much. Oh wait. Blue, well, do you want the pedigree or do you want blue sky? And then we can shut. shut I, I want. I want to ask question number two. Because <laughs> action of semifilam, the why it is so radical, and is there any convincing proof? Now you just went through the Flemish and the Arctic and the ill. Can you still hear me, Doctor Doctor Robinson? You're breaking up, Joe. Okay. Can you still Can you still hear me? Can you, Yep. Can Can you hear me? Can't now? hear you. You can't hear me. Darn. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can. I can hear you if you can't hear me. Now, I, I can frozen. hear you. Uh, you're frozen. You're, you've been freezing. 
can, can to you start over? Okay. Okay. You can hear me now though. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, so, uh, the You're question still kind was, of frozen though on the, on the, uh, okay. Uh, as long as I can hear you, go yeah, ahead. I'll just keep going as long as you can hear me. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us about the mechanism of action of semiphalan? Why it is so radical? And is there any convincing proof? Now, you just did. So uh, I, can, I can move on to the next one. But did you have anything to add for that one? Uh, well, it really is radical. And, yeah. and it's, to, it's to Lindsay's credit that she's able to think so much outside the box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agreed. I mean, it's a very different, very different way of approaching things. And it really, I mean, when I think of I, the nicotinic cholinergic receptor, which is what we're talking about, uh, and to think that it's that this drug is affecting something binding to another protein next to it, I mean, that's way out, yeah. that's really outside the yeah. box. Yes. Uh, and more, more patterns. I got a question. Okay. And so for everybody at home. Yeah, the problem is yeah. um, where we know every amino acid is and how it sits. It's just how it migrated, but it is a different conformation. If there wasn't a different conformation, it wouldn't migrate under an electric field differently. So, and then when they threw, <coughs> pardon, <coughs> sumophilam at it, it migrated the way it normally does. Okay. So in Alzheimer's uh, disease, there's some conformation that isn't migrating the way it should, and sumophilam corrects that. Okay. I and that's... That's their point about, about what it is. But think about how many confirmations um, something that is that long with that many kinks. I mean, really, literally, it's like this rail, it's like the railroad cars, you know, except that they're now, instead of flattened out in the field, they're in space. Yeah. And think of how many ways. It turns out, just to get a little technical, that they're basically three positions that two. Now I've, re I've reset the computer. Uh, so I'm sorry about that, everybody. I reset the internet. So uh, sorry about that. So I'm, I'm so sorry, Dr. Robinson. Please You're clear. Okay, good. Oh, good. So I, I, apparently I wasn't there for a while. So yeah, so please keep going. You were coming through. It was good news. So please keep going. Oh, okay. Yeah. So where, where do you want us to re uh, reboot or restart? Uh, so it was the number of combinations uh, was, it was, in, it was like, it was three to the 2600 power. And, and which is just, it was an it's unbelievable. Not, it's, yeah. It is. Yeah. And an unbelievable. And it's, it's, but that's that's the way it is. But uh, oh, I mean, there's some that you can't have because you'd have the chains smacking up against one another. But it, it's a huge number. Um, but um, so anyway, that that's that's basically what Lindsay's saying. So can I ask um, why is it so difficult to determine these the existence or to isolate these conformations or to see them? Oh, because they're they're because their proteins are mobile, they're floppy, they're all over the place. Oh. Um, and so it is almost, I regard it as miraculous that our proteins have one conformation. They could have <laughs> gazillions. I think the fact that out of all the conceivable number of proteins, that some of them just choose to have a few conformations is miraculous as far as I can determine. Yeah. Uh, for instance, I once did a, a study. Just imagine, you know, so what, what, are, what are we made of? We're basically made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. That's pretty much it for proteins and some sulfur, all right? Yep. The DNA has phosphorus. But so imagine if you had the whole earth, the whole mass of the earth made out of those five elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The entire mass of the earth, and you made one molecule of an amino acid that could be one of 20 things. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you, you did that. And then you hooked two of them together. Yeah. Well, you got 400 possibilities there. Yeah. <laughs> and you keep hooking them on and making one molecule at a time. And if you had the whole mass of the earth, the entire mass of the earth, how many proteins, when would you, when would you run out of material? How much, how big a protein could you make? Wow. Oh my well, God. Well, that's tricky. But the answer is about 80. Okay. Okay. You could make one, one molecule of every protein that had 80 amino acids in it. 
Okay. Because each one, each of that 80 is 80 to the 20th, no, 20 to the 80th power, wow. which is again more. That's so the idea that a protein would have one conformation is literally miraculous. It is miraculous. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Wow. So um, I don't want yeah. to get theological, but it really is incredible when you know some chemistry. Okay. okay so if, if, so if I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on to the next question, if it's okay. Yeah. So this is, this is a sort of some more about what, what your main point is that if the trials, the data is what's important and then the theory can come second. So this is more. Exactly. About, uh, yeah. But this is more about the theory and we'd like to hear about your expertise in this area. So uh, it's a bit of a long question. Filament A has been shown to bind to more than 90 proteins in the cells. Yep. Playing roles in regulating skeletal and brain development, formation of heart tissue, blood vessels, blood clotting, skin elasticity, the maintenance of lung yep. tissue, and the function of the digestive system, amongst others. But that you had said, because of this, you had said, it seems, in, quote, it seems inconceivable that there won't be other effects in the neuron or elsewhere in the body due to changes in the interaction with the other 89 proteins filament A interacts with. Some of them are likely to be yep. toxic, but so that would certainly seem to be the, a big problem if semifilam were altering the healthy conformation of filament A. But Cassava says semifilam is only binding to the altered conformation of filament A. And then given Sava's, Cassava's, semifilam's safety and tolerability has been exemplary by all counts in every study, including fewer adverse events in drug arms than placebo arm in phase 2B, uh, what, so, so what do you think of the idea that semifilam is able to avoid those toxicities by only targeting the altered compound? Uh, examples, one of which I think many people have heard of. Uh, in other words, the, the vaccines came out against COVID, okay? And after they came out, uh, they tested them for safety. Yeah. And then they found out blood problems. I don't know whether you heard about that, but it was, a, it was a big problem with one of the vaccines, primarily in Europe. No. And so some, some complications, just you won't, the, the rare complications you won't find until you've tested in a million people. And there's no way that cassava could have done that. That's what, that's what I worry about, right. that it's doing, right. that this protein's got its fingers in so many pies, as you just said, yeah. that changing the conformation one place, who's to say that it won't, do something bad. I mean, this is purely theoretical, yep. but yep. And I'll give you another example. There was a great anti-convulsive, you know, or even now we don't have drugs that'll stop every person who has epilepsy. And there was a marvelous drug called Felbamate. And it, it stopped seizures that I couldn't stop. And it was just marvelous. And then all of a sudden, after a year or so, the FDA sends out, we found about six people or something whose bone marrow fell apart and they died. Oh. Well, and so I, if, what do you do? You call in all your patients who are on Felbamate, put them in the hospital and stop the drug and hope they don't go into convulsions, wow. which didn't happen. Yeah. Uh, but the drug, in other words, this wasn't shown until lots and lots of people were on the drug. And similarly, that's my concern about well, okay. uh, feeling, but I think people will accept it. And even now, people sign a waiver to take felbamate. They know that it could kill them, but it's so much better. Yeah. I mean, that that is a possibility. This is way down, way down the road. Yep. yep. But uh, yep. that sort of thing does happen. That's and valid. it valid. only happens with a zillion people yep. when they've had the drug. And it's, believe me, if sumophilam works, there would be a zillion people having the drug. <laughs> So very fair points. Very thank you very much, Dr. Robinson. Yeah. I'm going to give just a few more here. Uh, so, what do you think of claims that it's impossible for there to be femtomolar level binding uh, to filament A? What is your opinion the filament A of the filament A binding studies? Uh, I I agree. I agree with those claims. Okay. 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 I, I mean, I I don't. I mean, Lindsay and I have gone around around about that, and I I just have problems accepting a binding that tight yep. and a meaningful binding in, in the brain. Yep. So basically I agree, yep. but my point is that it's irrelevant yep. okay. based on the data. Yep. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Wang, uh, Huyan Wang is the primary researcher that made these discoveries. 
People that bet against the company have raised negative speculation around his Western blots. Can you comment on that? And as a follow-up, the company has already been cleared twice by journals publishing expressions of concern raised by the negative parties. There's still a journal of neuroscience expression of concern that will await the City University of New York investigation. Uh, can you comment on that stuff? So not really. I mean, even though I know about electrophoresis, I'm not a... Uh an electrophoresis guy. I mean, I, I did stuff, you know, I, I never used electrophoresis back when I was a chemist. Okay. But uh, so I really can't comment intelligently on that. Okay. Fair enough. I appreciate the honesty. And then uh, yeah. what so you treated, uh, you, you were a neurologist that treated a lot of other conditions. Uh, what is the potential yeah. for somifilam to treat Parkinson's or any other indications? It's conceivable. Um, but uh, the, the protein that's going off in Parkinson's disease, which is also forming amyloid, is called alpha-synuclein. And that's a completely different conformation and a protein than, uh, uh, but uh, let me, oh yeah, that's another point. Just, it's very typical. Uh, so let me uh, just say that uh, I have quite an experience with the treatment of Parkinson's disease. I was in the military uh, during Vietnam, and I was an Air Force doc from 68 to 70. And in 1970, I left the military, <clears throat> pardon, and completed my residency at University of Colorado. And L-DOPA, which is the first decent drug we had for Parkinson's disease, came out. And so the chief, Dr. Jim Alston, called me up and said, uh, Robinson, we want you to run the L-DOPA clinic. We don't know what it's going to do. The European results have been incredible. And it was incredible. I literally saw a one or two people get out of wheelchairs. I mean, it was like Lord, ah, all right? Yeah. And yeah, it was amazing. But not everybody responded exactly the same way. And that's so typical of everything in medicine. You get what you think is a disease and the, the response of patients to anything you do varies between the patients. Some people, there was one guy when I was back in Billings that I thought I'd really screwed up because why do I have this guy on L-DOPA? He doesn't show any sign of Parkinson's disease. It just worked so well on this one man for about five years. And then uh, he had to have surgery for something or other. I mean, totally unrelated to his Parkinson's disease. Well, L-DOPA could at that time could only be given by mouth. So he stopped the L-DOPA. And the man just clenched up, yeah. but on the, on the medication, he was perfect. Yeah. And so that was an incredibly good response, yeah. but not everybody has it. Ditto for these five uh, people in the, the Sumophila right. study. A good point. Very, thank you for that. It's a very, very yeah. Point. So I, I'm amazed, you know, if, you know, just imagine if you'd thrown an anti-cancer drug at, at a thousand cancer patients, you might not find a significant effect if, if, if your mix of types of cancer, right? because at least we know there are different types of cancer. So we, 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 we separate it, but we don't know that there are different types of Alzheimer's. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, uh, can you, you, you've, you've left this out. Uh, can you speak about your pedigree? You, you actually just, you've really started to allude to it, but can you speak about your pedigree? Yeah, well, well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I, uh, it, it, I didn't want it to be off-putting. And this is so typical of the ever in Montana tell people who you are. Yeah. You just act and they figure out who you are. Mm -hmm. You never just say, oh, I'm this, I'm that, mm -hmm. because there aren't that many people there. Actually, when I was there, there were more cows than people in Montana. But <laughs> uh, they, they, they both, they'll find out how you are. And so, all right, so now you've heard me talk and here's the pedigree, all right. So I graduated uh, from Princeton University in 1960 and I was Phi Beta Kappa and in the top 5% of the class. And I was a member of Sigma Xi, which is the Scientific Honorary Society. Then I went to Harvard wow. uh, and worked under probably the greatest synthetic organic chemist of the 20th century, Dr. R.B. Woodward. And I was sufficiently good at chemistry. It just came very naturally to me. I don't know why. It certainly math doesn't, but chemistry does. And so I was good at the tender age of 22 to go up to Dr. Woodward with an idea that I had about chemistry 
And he said, that's a good idea. Why don't you work on it for your PhD? And so rather than uh, working on Woodward's idea, I worked on my own. Now Woodward later won the Nobel in chemistry. Wow. Okay. So that's how good an idea. Now I, I, I couldn't make it work, but a friend of mine who stayed on in chemistry, Joe Landisberg, who was the chief and who was the department chair at Delphi for maybe 50 years said, yeah, it worked. You just couldn't make it work, but it worked. Okay. <laughs> so that's that. Then I went on, but I really, a research really wasn't for me. So I, I went back to med. I really wanted originally, uh, intended to be a physician. My uncle was a physician. It's a great role model in the people that I came from. And Uncle Irv took me on rounds when I was 10. And, you know, that's, that's an incredible experience for a young kid. I'll say. And so I went back to medicine. I went to the University of Pennsylvania and got my MD degree there. So that's my uh, pedigree. That's pretty uh, impressive. That's impressive. Yeah. But you see, I think if I'd said that at the beginning, it would have been off putting some. So I dealt you know, with it. But you can't. My wife's. Uh, my wife's cello teacher who just retired is a lady whose family goes back to the Mayflower and she's sort of kind of ashamed of it, but you know, you are what you are. So there you have it. So your, your people um, can listen and decide what they like, but I, um, they really should listen to what I said rather yeah. than what I, the, you know, the pedigree. Well, I really think, and I, I think that you made, I mean, your argument about these trials should go on and we'll see what the data says. I think everybody here agrees with you. But then huh. your, uh, your insights for all the chemistry were just so helpful. We've been talking about this stuff and arguing about this stuff without having oh, yeah. these insights. And it's been very, it's a, hearing from an expert like yourself has been extremely, I can speak for myself, but and I'm looking at the comments here and, and there's just so many people saying, thank you so much. Uh, thank you really? so much. I, 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 so here's one, I really appreciate this technical explanation. This is the kind of, from a, a lot of... Well, it's technical. I mean, it really is super, yeah, technical. super technical. There's no way around it. Yeah, there, there really is no way around it. Yeah, the, the, char yeah. <laughs> the charges... So on you're the breaking up, Joe. Oh, sorry. So I, I, I can still hear you if you can still hear me. Keep talking. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, your your voice is sometimes breaking up. Okay, I'll, I'll see if, if I can get a question for you here. Uh... So people appreciated why the theory isn't always understood. So Todd Gates says, Dr. Robinson, awesome explanation of why the theory isn't always, uh, isn't always fact or understood. Perhaps the authors of the citizens petition should evaluate their math and realize what they have stated is likely not what is. So, yeah. Well, uh, you know, there's a lot more going on about the citizens petition. Uh, because some of the people behind it were shorting the stock. You know that. Uh, yes, we, yeah, we were, we're very familiar with that around here, yeah. And uh, one of the guys that did it is a guy named Brett. Are yes. You familiar with him? Yes, we are very familiar and with him as well. Speaking as a Princetonian, and Brett is a Princetonian, Yeah. everyone knows an asshole who went to Princeton. <laughs> it's just appalling behavior, just yeah. appalling. appalling. Yeah, agreed. I was so glad to hear you say that. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, we're we're appalled. They're trying to stop these trials around here as well. Thank you very much for saying so. Uh, and yeah. Joseph, Joseph Below is saying we appreciate the information in terms that we can understand. So helpful. Thank you very much. No, that's good. And uh, someone, another doctor here says, Doctor Robinson reminds me of my department chair from grad school. So honest, no BS. <laughs> oh no. I'm too old to too old to BS. <laughs> Way uh, too old. Did you have any comment on toll-like receptor four? There's a question here about TLR four. Yeah, about any possible interaction between TLR four and filament A being the key driver in improving cognition. It's conceivable. Uh, if if TLR four is one of the ninety that uh, filament interacts with, sure. Uh, TLR. TLR4 is very interesting. It's very important in embryology uh, and the development. And it also is a way that the cell figures out, helps figure out that there's a foreign invader like a microorganism or a virus. And it sort of sits there waiting. I forget which particular um, 
which protein or, or nucleic acid it responds to, but it basically responds to something inside the cell that shouldn't be there. Okay. And then it tr triggers an immune response and all, all sorts of stuff. So it's certainly possible. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and then as you were saying about a, the different, a different, well, you think it's one disease and it turns out to be that different people respond different ways. Did you have any comment about APOE4 as far as that's a mutation that a polymorphism? Yeah, that well, that's, that's, yeah, I even, I, yeah, I knew the guy at, at Penn. Uh, it was Alan, a guy named Alan Rose, Roses. Uh, I think he's passed on now. He was a resident when I was a medical student and uh, it was quite a, quite a, a bunch of neurologists there. And of course, you know, maybe 1% of medical students go into neurology. Well, at Penn, there was a guy named G. Milton Shy, who was a brilliant man, just brilliant. And he attracted a group of, he was describing like a disease a month, he and this neuropathologist named Gonatas. And Roses was one of the, uh, Alan Roses was one of the chief residents. And then he found out that there was this risk factor uh, called APOE, and uh, it, it really worked. Uh, and just, to show you that brilliance doesn't always protect you. So Shai uh, left Penn <clears throat> and went to be the chair of neurology at Columbia. And which at that time, and maybe still is, was the pinnacle, literally the pinnacle of American neurology. It was the best, Columbia was the king. You know, Penn was good, but Columbia was where it was at. It was sort of the Harvard of neurology. And so Dr. Shai, who was a man in his early 40s, you know, wasn't feeling too well, thought he had indigestion, went to his office, didn't call for any help, and died of a heart attack at, in his early 40s. Mm -hmm. and it was just amazing. So intelligence uh, doesn't always help you. Right. <laughs> but it was, it was great. It was a great. His son, I think, is, is a neurologist, too. Yep. Uh, wow. But yeah. I, I don't think he oh, produced it. Yeah. Has produced what the old man has done. And then Dr. Robinson, you've given us an hour. I, I got one more question if you, if you have time for one. Has more. it really been an hour? It's been an hour, yeah, believe it or not. It's, it's wow. Like, yeah, I know. Uh, well, it was it, kind of fun. It's been, it's been a lot of fun and very educational for us. So thank you so much. Uh, something big is happening with cassava now. They have this open label study that had this exciting data. And then this is moving into a placebo portion. So what we had mentioned, we talked earlier, there was a very, there was a there was a small placebo controlled trial that was one month that was then opened up. They were then then went into an open label for a year and that was expanded out to two hundred people. After a year, now people are then being randomized half on still on for the drug for six more months and then half off the drug for six months. That's the cognition maintenance study. There's a lot of hope that that might uh, bring accelerated approval for uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if 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 you get somebody who's 50% better and you stop the drug and they go back to what they were, yeah. that's a, a uh, humanitarian immediate approval. So you could see, conceivably see that within the coming year. Excellent. Ex excellent. Now, if that happens. Yeah. We're, we're if they've had yeah. a good therapeutic it effect. Works. And, you know, these are all, did you ever hear of something called the Hawthorne study? No. Uh, the Hawthorne study was a great study. And it's been criticized. It has to do with light bulbs. Back when the days when little old ladies sat in the room and made light bulbs for General Electric, assuming is General Electric still in business? I guess they are. Yeah. And so this was in the early days. I think it's probably a hundred years old, where they um, they studied these women. They were efficiency experts. How could they get more light bulbs out of these ladies? Okay. And so what they did was they improved the lighting. Ah. You know they. Yeah, and so light bulb production went up and then they maybe opened the blind so that there was light coming in and production went up. And then they even sort of, I don't know that they could pipe in music, but they, yeah, I suppose there were big trolls back then. So they, they had music playing and production went up. And then being scientists, what do you think they did? Well, they stopped, they started decreasing it. Okay, to see. And guess what happened? Production went up further, huh? and then they took away the light, and production went up further. People were just getting and better and better. Away. Yes, and what was going on was the placebo effect. These people were being paid attention to, huh. and there, and so it's called the Hawthorne effect. And yeah. so 
in every drug you ever use, particularly with migraine, yeah. there are placebo effects. And it's conceivable that all these people feeling better on the open label trial, we're seeing a Hawthorne effect. That must be kept in mind. Yeah. It exists. We're human beings. Yeah. Uh, we respond to hope and all sorts of people have studied placebo effects yeah. and there are changes in the brain. And uh, like you do point out, the, the, the pain is, there's, there's studies show the pain is the big one where there's a placebo effect, self oh, yeah. pain, yeah. There are apocryphal stories about people in World War II being wounded and be given, uh, and really? they ran out of morphine on the battlefield, being given a shot of saline and smiling and going to sleep. Oh, I mean, those are very apocryphal, but well, yeah. There, there's, so it's conceivable that what we've seen is a placebo effect. Yeah. I, I, before we run out of time, I just want to keep going because you're such an, you're such an expert in the proteins. So this drug is working by uh, by supposedly by by binding misphotoproteins and making them better, making them uh, conform right. correctly. All of all the drugs that I've looked at in a study that had long term uh, studies of protein misfolding small molecule drugs like this one, in the ones that worked, the effect got better and better and better and better over two and a half, two years or two years of, of all of them. And yeah, that's true. Yeah. And this is very, let me tell you another, another clinical story. Okay. Please. Um, back, you know, as I say, the chief asked me at, at Colorado in September of, of, of 1970 to open the L-DOPA clinic. Well, we were very scared. We didn't know what the hell it was do. We knew that L-DOPA caused nausea. Yeah. And so we were, very, very cautious. We gave tiny little doses and we watched them and we had them back. And what was really fascinating was that on the same dose of L-DOPA, people kept getting better. Wow. And, and that was a mistake that people, that GPs would make. They'd say, oh, you did well with L-DOPA. Well, I'll give you twice as much. You do twice as well. And they would run into toxicity. Yeah. So, it's very typical, it was typical of L-DOPA that the effects continued uh, to improve for a couple of weeks on the same dose. Wow. And the similar thing occurs, well, not with some of the newer <clears throat> antidepressants, but a similar thing occurs uh, with antidepressants. Antidepressants until we got this one that's like uh, the, the party drug, uh, take a couple of weeks to work. Yeah. And that's just how wacky the nervous system is and how little we understand about why these things happen, but they do happen. Mm -hmm. So that, that is legit Excellent. sort of a thing. Excellent. And then the coming off period of six months then, is that what, I assume that'll be enough time to show a difference between drug and placebo group? Or, or is yeah. there a chance? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 it should. Yeah. It, it, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing. Yep. I would, one would think that however the, you know, these people aren't just tested at two points, they're tested at multiple points in between. Yeah, right, right, right. I would suggest, I would guess that the, the deterioration would, would climb down the same slope, but I don't know. Yep. Don't know. Excellent. Uh, I'm looking at the comments here, Dr. Robinson, and there's just many, many people uh, saying, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, just a lot of thank yous. And uh, and just so many thank yous, oh, way, way too many. And so you just talk to someone with your expertise and to be able to pick your brain a little bit was just so helpful. And uh, and, and to hear your just your, just your expert opinion and insights and, and your opinion about about what the trial is, this is very important. So thank you so much for making time for okay. it. And uh, and we've been and we've been keeping an eye on your blog as well. So we'll we'll invite you back. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you uh, I'll send you what I want you to put on your blog as the link to, to a Lindsay study. Excellent. Uh, excellent. And then the, your blog is chemiotics too, I guess. Is that what it's called? Yeah. It's like semiotics. Okay. Like semi I got it. Okay. Semiotics and chemiotics. I yeah. got you. Got it. Okay. Great. Chemiotics. But I, you know, I'm not just writing. I'm not, I'm not writing about that. Mostly I've been consumed of course, like we all have yeah. with, with COVID of and what's going on with COVID. Well, did you see and that there's the Alzheimer's? Is, like what? Did you see that there's Alzheimer's like symptoms in one third of those that get COVID? Well, they talk about it. It's, it's hard to know, but I mean, so my blog is not just about, uh, it's whatever I'm interested in. And obviously Music. with kids over in China, uh, I'm very, very interested in COVID. And, but this, I don't, do you want to, do you want to hear how we really missed the boat on COVID? Yes. All right. 
So, so my boy has been over there in Hong uh, Kong, in, in Hong Kong for uh, 10 years and he really likes it. And he married a Chinese woman and she gave him two wonderful children. And, and so I was looking, I've been starting a year, two and a half years ago. And so I was fascinated with what was going on in Hong Kong. And then in June, I guess of 2018, 2019, I'm not sure exactly which, there were riots in Hong Kong about the government. And so I was watching it, reading the, what's called the SCMP, South China Morning Post. Yeah. He, my son recommended that. You should read that. Okay. And then in January 27 of 2020, two years, well, two years and a month ago, there was a post by a Dr. Gabriel Leung, L-E-U-R-N-G. That's just an anglicization of his name. Yep. And Dr. Leung was the Dean of Medicine at one of the medical schools in Hong Kong. And he said, this virus is all over China. Yeah. It's in every major Chinese city. This is January of 20. Yeah. And presumably our government was monitoring China. So we had a tip off yeah. that this was never going to stay in China literally in the first month and it was ignored. I mean, the FDA and they blew it so bad. Yep, yep. Uh, it's not that they would have prevented the epidemic, but at least they would have been prepared for it. it it's just a poll. Yeah, yeah. Talking about COVID and, and what? Uh, yep, an independent thinker. So we need that for sure. Yeah. Maybe Joe Rogan can have you on that. You're, you're broken up. Oh, shoot. Uh, Joe? Can, you, can you still hear me? I'll keep talking. Nope. Can you, you can hear me, Dr. Robinson? I can hear you, but you're not moving. Okay. Well, uh, so if you can hear me, we'll, we'll uh, maybe you can go on Joe Rogan and because uh, that, that, that the no, about... no, no, no. I'm not, <laughs> I found this very stressful, but uh, oh. my blood pressure is what was it, 175 over 60 or something this morning? No, no, oh my, oh my, oh, that's yeah, very well, helpful. that's very, very no, helpful. it's normally okay. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad. Well, you've been so helpful. Thank you for going through the stress of being here. And, and you didn't seem stressed, so you seemed great. So thanks so much. Well, once you get going, you know, you're in the moment. And, yep. you know. That's exactly right. It's the way it is with stage fright and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Cool. Take well, care. Uh, to, to, to take care. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we'll end it there. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Robinson, for being here. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And we'll see you later. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. See you.